Thank you, Paul. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to celebrate Stephen Hawking. I first met him when I enrolled as a graduate student here in Cambridge. He was two years senior to me and already unwell. And astronomers are used to large numbers, but few are as large as the odds I'd have given them against this event 50 years later, celebrating his sustained crescendo of achievement and celebrity. But I'm going to start with a bit of history. Here's Newton, Stephen's greatest predecessor, and Trinity College's best ever student. <laughs> he must have thought about space travel. This picture shows cannonballs being fired from a mountain top, and Newton calculated that to fire them into orbit requires a speed of 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond the technology of his time. And it wasn't until 1957 that this was achieved by the Soviet Sputnik. And then, of course, only uh, 12 years later, we had this famous iconic picture and the Apollo landings. Manned space flight has languished a bit because you've got to be middle-aged to remember these events. And since that time, no one has been further than low Earth orbit mainly in the space station. But space technology has burgeoned. We use it in our everyday lives, and unmanned probes have beamed back pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. Let's have a quick tour out in our solar system. If you look back from about 10 million miles away at the Earth, you'd see something like this. And then you get to the red planet, Mars, which has been studied by many space probes. The Curiosity probe uh, has been for nearly five years trundling around on its surface uh, ac across this big crater. And here, a quarter of the way up, you can see its track marks as it uh, traverses this crater, sending back views like this. Further on out, we get to Jupiter, the giant of our solar system, and uh, several probes have been there. Recently, one called Juno, which just the last month sent back these first pictures um, of the North Pole and funny uh, climate there. These are the four big moons of Jupiter, known since Galileo's time. Uh, they're very different. There's Io, sulfurous and volcanic. Here's Europa, uh, uh, covered in ice. Then we get to Saturn and the Cassini probe, a real antique. It's more than 20 years since it was launched, but it's still going around, taking pictures of Saturn and its moons. And here's one picture it took of Titan, which is a giant moon of, uh, of Saturn. Um, and uh, it may look rather nice with all these lakes and things, but the temperature is minus 160 degrees centigrade, and these lakes are liquid methane. Another moon of Saturn is Enceladus. And this is, again, uh, covered in ice. Um, there's certainly liquid water uh, underneath, and sometimes sprays are seen coming out. In the last couple of years, we've had the uh, ESA Rosetta probe of the comet, and we've had also uh, NASA's New Horizons sending back pictures of Pluto. And there's Pluto with its moon, Triton. And this is 5,000 times further away than the moon, being sent back with 1990s technology. Amazing achievements. And I think it reminds us that in most of our subjects, it's really the experimenters who deserve more credit than the armchair theorists. That's true in this field. It's plainly true in gravitational radiation as well. So let's acclaim these works. Well, what about uh, humans? Uh, will uh, humans um, uh, in this century uh, go back further into space? I hope that the entire solar system will be permeated by flotillas of robotic craft and fabricators. But as AI advances, there's less practical need for people. Nonetheless, I hope people will follow the robots, but it will be as adventurers, not for practical goals. And the private enterprise effort in space, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the rest, they can tolerate higher risks than NASA or ESA can impose on civilians and thereby cut costs. And they will soon be sending people into Earth orbit for the next year or two, and then round the moon, 
and back in about five days. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight. And that might tell you something. <laughs> but later this century, courageous thrill-seekers in the mould of, say, Felix Baumgarten, who broke the sound barrier in free fall from a high-altitude balloon, or our own Savannah Fines, who dragged a sledge across the Antarctic winter, crazy people like that, <laughs> may establish a base on Mars. And Elon Musk himself has said that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> and he's um, just 46 now, so he might make it. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. You've got to solve them here. Coping with climate change is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. But... But our descendants here on Earth should cheer on these space adventurers. And this is why. Precisely because space is an inherently hostile environment for humans, they will have far more incentive than those on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness the super-powerful genetic and cyborg technology that will be developed by 2100. Those techniques will be heavily regulated on Earth, but the Martians would be far beyond the clutches of the regulators. So it's these spacefarers, not those of us comfortably adapted to the Earth, who spearhead the post-human era, evolving within a few centuries into a new species. Organic humans like us need a planetary surface environment, but if post-humans make the transition to fully inorganic intelligences, they won't need an atmosphere. They might prefer zero-G, especially for constructing huge artefacts. So, even if intelligence were now unique to the Earth, it needn't remain a cosmic sideshow, embodied in generations of self-improving machines, advancing via intelligent design, not Darwinian selection. It could join future aeons spread far beyond the solar system. Interstellar voyages would hold no terrors for near-immortals. But is there life beyond the Earth already? There could be freeze-dried bacteria on Mars or something swimming under the ice of Europa or Enceladus. But prospects look far brighter if we widen our horizons to the realm of the stars beyond the range of any probe that's feasible today. And perhaps the hottest current topic in astronomy is the realisation that many other stars, perhaps most of them, are orbited by retinues of planets, like the Sun is. These planets aren't detected directly, but they're inferred by precise measurements of the motional brightness of their parent star. Here's one method. The star would dim slightly when a planet was in transit in front of it. For instance, an Earth-like planet going across a Sun-like star would make the star fainter by one part in 10,000 as it moved across it. And the Kepler spacecraft pointed steadily at a seven-degree patch of sky for more than three years, monitoring the brightness of over 150,000 stars at least once or twice an hour with a precision of one part in 100,000 looking for these regular dips. And it found literally thousands of planets, many no bigger than the Earth. Because we can infer their size, of course, from the depth of the dip and the length of their year from the interval between successive dips. And this uh, rather silly cartoon uh, summarizes the data from Kepler uh, where it's scaled to give the masses of the planets and the lengths of their years. We're especially interested in possible twins of our Earth, planets the same size as ours, on orbits with temperatures such that water neither boils nor stays frozen, the so-called habitable zone. In fact, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, has a planet orbiting it not much bigger than the Earth. But another nearby faint star has seven Earth 
like planets orbiting it. This is the data where you can see very clearly the dips from seven different planets with seven different periods. It's a sort of miniature solar system. The star these planets are orbiting is 1% as bright as the sun, and the years for these planets are measured in days, as you can see there. I won't explain why it's called TRAPPIST-1, but it uh, was discovered by a very small telescope, um, and it's been studied by other telescopes to uh, uh, measure these dips. Now, it's uh, an extraordinary system. Um, if, you were, or if you were on this, it would be really spectacular, because viewed from the surface of one of the planets, the others would move across the sky, being as big as a full moon in our sky, because it's such a tiny, tiny system. And it would be very unearthly, actually, um, although there may be Earth in size, um, because probably these planets are tidally locked, so they present the same face to the star, just as the moon presents the same face to the Earth. So half would be in perpetual light, the other half always dark. And if there's civilization there, there'll be a sort of apartheid, with the astronomers on the dark side, everyone else in the other hemisphere. Well, uh, the real goal, of course, is to see these planets like this and the many others directly, not just to infer them from these transits. But that's hard. To realize how hard, let's suppose that alien astronomers with a powerful telescope were looking at the Earth from, say, 20 light years away, distance of a nearby star. Our planet would seem in Carl Sagan's phrase, a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, which would outshine it by many billions. A firefly next to a searchlight, as it were. And the shade of blue would be slightly different, depending on where the Pacific Ocean or the Eurasian landmass was facing the aliens. So the aliens could learn quite a bit if they could observe this pale blue dot. They could learn the length of our day, that there were oceans and continents, the seasons, the gross topography, and the climate, just by looking at the changes in the color and taking the spectrum of the light from it. Well, we can't do that now, but in about 10 years, we'll have one telescope that can do this. This telescope is being built by a European consortium that we belong to. Um, Europeans aren't very imaginative in their nomenclature. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope. And it's got a mirror 39 meters across, a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass. And this will be able to do experiments looking at planets around nearby stars, rather as the hypothetical aliens will look at the Earth. So we can learn quite a bit about uh, uh, some of these stars. Well, the basic figures, and uh, Brian Cox mentioned this, is that we have uh, in our galaxy literally billions of planets, and uh, uh, a lot of them are sort of habitable, in the sense that they've got where the temperature of water can exist. But habitable doesn't mean inhabited, as Brian emphasized. And we still don't know the likelihood of life. We know too little about how it began on Earth to lay confident odds. We don't know what triggered the transition from complex molecules to uh, entities that can metabolize and reproduce. It might have been a fluke, or it might have been a crucial transition that happened anywhere given the right environment. We just don't know. Nor do we know if the RNA, DNA chemistry of terrestrial life is the only possibility, or whether options which are quite different could be realized elsewhere. Moreover, even if simple life were widespread, we can't assess the odds that it evolves into a complex biosphere. Brown conjectured this could be very low, and indeed it could. But even if it did so evolve, it might be unrecognizably different. It might have had a billionaire head start over us and have long ago downloaded into electronic form and left its home planet. But even though we can't be too optimistic, I think SETI programs looking for some transmission that's manifestly not natural, are a worthwhile gamble. Which would be so exciting if we could learn that 
concept of logic and physics weren't limited to the hardware in human skulls. And in fact, a Russian investor called Yuri Milner has pledged $10 million a year to expand and broaden SETI searches. And I think we should welcome this. Far better he should do this than spend the money on a football team or a yacht. <laughs> of course, there are some people who think they already know that there are a lot of aliens. I get letters from people who say um, that they've been uh, visited or abducted. Um, and uh, I say two things to these people. First, do they really think that if the aliens had made the huge effort to come here across interstellar space, they would just meet one or two well-known cranks, make a corn circle, and go away again? <laughs> and the second thing I say is that these people should write to each other and not to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, well, back now to the stars far simpler than biology. Stars are powered by nuclear fusion, and we understand their life cycle and how it depends on their mass. This is a time-lapse pictures indicate it, and we, we have remnants, white dwarfs are left by stars like the sun. Uh, bigger stars leave neutron star remnants, and the biggest uh, leave black holes that might give the strongest gravitational wave signals. And Stars are being born and dying all the time. And we see places like this, the Eagle Nebula, where even now new stars are condensing from uh, dusty gas, forming protostars with dusty disks from which planets will form. And we see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in about six billion years, blowing off its outer layers, leaving a white dwarf behind it. And here's another dying star. But more massive stars die more explosively, and this object, one of the most famous objects in the sky, is the Crab Nebula, which is the, Witten, the remnant of a supernova witnessed and recorded by Chinese astronomers. Ah, oh, what's happened here? Uh -huh. uh, can any? I need some help, probably. Disconnect. Okay, that's all, that's all right. Okay, yes. Okay, um, and uh, uh, this is the record of the, uh, the Chinese court astronomer, their astronomer royal, who says a guest star appeared brighter than the moon and, uh, uh, and then faded away. Any Chinese speakers will be able to say if that is what it actually says. I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't tell. Um, but anyway, nearly a thousand years later, uh, we see uh, this crab nebula in the sky. Objects like this may seem far away and irrelevant, but thanks largely to this man, Fred Hoyle, a uh, professor here, we realize that if it wasn't for those supernovae, we wouldn't be here. Because it is from these that the atoms of which we are made have emerged. The idea is this. A massive star gets its energy by nuclear fusion. It turns hydrogen to helium, then helium into carbon, and then further up the periodic table. So before it has an energy crisis, it's got this onion, skill uh, onion skin structure where the hotter inner layers are burned further up the periodic table. And then, when it explodes, these are spewed out, as in the Crab Nebula, and will eventually merge with the interstellar gas, and new stars will then form from pristine gas contaminated by the ejecta from these earlier supernovae. And uh, I think one of the greatest achievements of, uh, uh, of astronomy in the last half century, really, was uh, done by Hoyle in collaboration with Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage and Willie Fowler, shown here at Willie Fowler's 60th birthday party, because they uh, showed in detail uh, how these reactions in stars could give rise to the abundances we observe of different chemical elements. They explain why carbon and oxygen are common, but gold and uranium are rare, and how they came into our solar system. How we are literally the ashes of long dead stars, or if you're less romantic, the nuclear waste from the fuel that made stars shine. <clears throat> and our Milky Way galaxy is a sort of system where gas is being recycled through successive generations of stars. Well, let's now enlarge our horizon from 
our galaxy, our Milky Way with its 100 billion stars, to the wider universe. If we could get three million light years away and look back at our galaxy, it would look something like this. This, of course, is Andromeda, the nearest big galaxy to us. It's a circular disk viewed obliquely where stars are orbiting around a central hub with, incidentally, a black hole in the middle. And here's another galaxy, the Whirlpool, which, uh, which uh, Brown showed. And this uh, shows um, the distribution of galaxies within a few hundred million light years. And we see they are grouped together uh, in clusters. And with a larger sample, you can actually study the statistics of these clusters. Well, it might seem that it's pretty hopeless to learn anything about uh, galaxies because um, they are very far away. And whereas a particle physicist can do experiments by crashing particles together at the LHC, uh, we are helpless. We can't do experiments on galaxies. And moreover, they change on a very slow time scale. But we can study them in the virtual world of our computer. We can say, what would happen if two galaxies collided? And here's uh, a movie of, of such a calculation. Two galaxies falling together. And there's a sort of train wreck, and this will eventually settle down to be one amorphous galaxy. And I should warn you that the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into our Milky Way just like this, but in four billion years. But this is happening in other places. This is a picture of two uh, galaxies. Um, and uh, looking at this picture, you can infer that they've got dangerously close. One has pulled out a tidal plume on the other. And that if we came back in 100 million years, we'd find that these two had also merged. We can also, incidentally, do these kinds of calculations for different assumptions, different amounts of gas and stars, different amounts of dark matter, etc. And thereby, we can get an understanding of galaxy morphology and what galaxies are made of. And we can also test our theories in another way, because we can look at galaxies a billion light years away, two billion and so on, and actually see if they change in the way they ought to. And we can look very far back. This is a picture showing a patch of sky a few odd minutes across. It would take 100 patches like this to cover the full moon in the sky. And this contains hundreds of galaxies, many fully the equal of our Milky Way, looking so small and faint because their distance being so great. They're about 11 or 12 billion light years away. We're seeing them when they're recently formed. And here's one of the most distant objects um, between these bars, uh, which was observed by Imperial College people uh, in 2011. And uh, this is the only spectrum I'm going to show. This is the light from that object. And uh, for the physicists here, I point out that the Lyman Alpha line, normally in the far ultraviolet, 1260 nanostroms, is here in the infrared. It's stretched in wavelength by, by a factor of 8.2 due to the redshift between emission and reception. This object, incidentally, is not a normal galaxy, it's a quasar, where the uh, gas in it is being excited not just by stars, but by a quasar uh, due to a black hole in the center. Gas swirling into a black hole gets very hot and produces more luminosity than all the stars put together. And there the object was easiest to see at these very high redshifts. Well, again, as, Paul, as um, Brian mentioned, uh, if we look still further away, we look back to an era before there were any galaxies. And we look at the microwave background radiation discovered by these two people, Penges and Wilson, uh, 52 years ago. And they found us that intergalactic space is not completely cold. It's filled with microwaves, which have a black body spectrum, indicating that they're the relic of a hot big, big bang. And Brown showed us a time chart rather like this. Um, people sometimes worry about this when they're told that everything started off in this hot amorphous gas because they've probably heard about the second law of thermodynamics, which says that structures tend to get washed out. But here we're saying that the universe was initially fairly homogeneous and now it's got huge density contrast from the hot surfaces of stars to the cold, dark night sky. And that might seem to violate the second law. But the answer to the seeming paradox lies in the force of gravity. Gravity enhances density contrasts rather than wiping them out. 
any patch that starts off slightly denser than average will decelerate more because it feels an extra uh, gravity. Its expansion lags further and further behind, and it stops expanding. And uh, this, this movie uh, shows a simulation of part of a virtual universe. The expansion scaled out, so it looks the same, same size, uh, but you can clearly see uh, the incipient structure unfolding and evolving. Uh, the blue is the dark matter, um, and the, uh, the red is the atoms, the baryons, which are about a fifth of the, of the mass of dark matter. And this is a simulation showing how in a region of the universe, you can end up with a galaxy starting off with these very, very small perturbations. So movies of this kind portray how galaxies emerged in galaxy-scale clumps, and they get compressed eventually to make galaxies, and each galaxy is in an arena within which stars, planets, and perhaps life can evolve. And there's one important point. The fluctuations which are fed into the simulations I just showed you at the initial, they're not arbitrary. They are the ones which uh, Brian mentioned, which are uh, measured by the Planck spacecraft in the microwave background. The, the fluctuations exist over the whole sky. This is a different projection of the whole sky, and uh, the amplitude is about one part in 100,000. And it is these fluctuations... Uh, if you put them in the computer and run it forward, you end up with uh, galaxies and they're distributed in a way that we observe. And this is really a great triumph, I think, of, uh, uh, of what we observe. Well, just a digression about the far future of the universe. In 1998, cosmologists had a big surprise. It was by then well known that dark matter dominated the gas, but it was known that the dark matter was about 30% of the so-called critical density needed to stop the expansion. So it was expected that the universe would expand, being decelerated, because everything's out of gravity, pulling everything else, but it would never come to a stop. So the middle picture there. But to everyone's surprise, it turned out that it was like the picture on the right, where the expansion is speeding up. So gravity was seemingly overwhelmed by a mysterious new force, latent in empty space, which pushes galaxies away from each other. And Einstein himself introduced a force like this in his theory, which he called the cosmological constant, which is normally denoted by the Greek letter lambda. But long-range forecasts should always be treated skeptically, but the evidence suggests that distant galaxies will accelerate away, eventually disappearing over the horizon, rather as happens when things fall into a black hole and that after 100 billion years, there'll be nothing left in view other than the merged remnant of us and Andromeda, filled with dying, faint stars. So that's the long-term scenario. Here's a time chart of cosmology again. We can trace with confidence back to one second. Indeed, probably back to a nanosecond. That's when each particle had about 50 GeV of energy, about as much as could be produced in a big accelerator. And the entire observable universe was then squeezed down to the size of our solar system. But questions like, where did the fluctuation come from? Why did the early universe expand the way it does? And why does it contain the mix of protons, photons, and dark matter? These questions take us back to the even briefer instance when our universe was hugely more compressed still and where experiments offer no direct guide to the relevant physics. At this point, I should insert a health warning, because I'm going to become rather more speculative. This magazine cover shows the universe when it was 10 to the minus 36 seconds old, the era that Brown talked about. Real size. <laughs> it was really that big. And according to the inflation theory, that had expanded from something a billion times smaller than an atomic nucleus, a really hyperdense blob. And as Brown said, the generic idea of inflation gives a compelling explanation of the scale and gross uniformity of our universe and also how the fluctuations would have been imprinted by quantum effects when they were still of microscopic size. And indeed, 
many of the inventors of these important ideas are here for the conference this week. And here's another related fundamental question. How large is physical reality? The volume we can see is very large, but it's finite. That's essentially because there's a horizon. The shell around us, delineating the distance that light can have traveled since the Big Bang. But that shell has no more physical significance than the circle around you, which denotes your horizon if you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. We'd expect far more galaxies beyond the horizon. We don't know how many. There's no perceptible gradient across the visible universe. If you look as far as you can that way and that way, things look the same. So I think everyone would expect that it goes on hundreds of times further. And it could go much first, further still. Indeed, if it stretched far enough, then all combinatorial possibilities would be repeated. And far beyond the horizon, we'd all have avatars. And it may be some comfort that if you make a bad decision, your avatar way out there has made the right one. Be that as it may, even conservative astronomers are confident that the volume of space-time within range of our telescopes, what astronomers call the universe, is only a tiny fraction of the aftermath of our Big Bang. And that's not all. According to some theories, for instance, Andre Linde's eternal inflation scenario, our Big Bang isn't the only one. It could be just one island of space-time in a vast archipelago. So our universe, and its horizon is at the bottom right there, but there are all these other domains here. Well, these are suggestive but speculative, and what's needed to firm up these ideas, of course, is a well-corroborated theory which can describe physics at the inflationary era, trillions of, trillions of times higher than the LHC can reach. We don't have that. And if we can uh, pursue this further, then we'd like to understand which part of this decision tree is correct. First, are there many Big Bangs, or is it just one? Second, if there are many, are they all governed by the same physics or not? Are they all replicas of each other? Now, they may not be. Indeed, popular string theories suggest that there can be a whole lot of different vacuum states with different lambda and different microphysics. So it could be that the laws are the same everywhere we can observe, but uh, even if that's the case, the reason we can observe is such a tiny fraction of reality that it's consistent with very different laws elsewhere. So it's possible that domains far beyond our horizon or different Big Bangs may cool down into a cosmos where the laws or constants are different. And in this grander perspective, what we call the laws of nature could be just parochial bylaws in our cosmic patch. And many patches could then be stillborn or sterile, because the laws prevailing in them might not allow any kind of complexity. Well, if physical reality is like this, then there's a real motivation to explore counterfactual universes governed by different physics, to explore what range of parameters would allow complexity to emerge. This is what's called anthropic selection. It's only fair to say that the A word makes some physicists foam at the mouth. They think it's far too speculative. But even they might find it helps to develop their intuition to think about these hypothetical universes. It's rather like counterfactual history, where historians conjecture what might have happened if the US had stayed a British colony, um, and biologists speculate about how vertebrates might have evolved if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out. So I want to briefly uh, give examples of four um, possible counterfactual universes. First, what about a universe where the strength of gravity was different? Gravity is, in a sense, a very weak force. If you take two, um, two protons, the ratio of the electric force between them to the gravitational force is a very large number, of order 10 to the 40th. Gravity is only significant on large scales because electric forces 
positive and negative cancel out on the big objects, whereas gravity um, is all of one sign, as it were, so it always wins. And this diagram, this is my favorite pedagogical diagram, uh, shows a log of mass upwards and log of radius along. And it's a very compressed scale, going up to 10 to the 78, as you can see. Um, and uh, uh, you can note a number of things. On this log-log plot, black holes are a line of slope 1, raised proportions of mass. You can note, incidentally, that a black hole, the radius of a proton, weighs 10 to 38 times as much as a proton. That's because gravity is very weak. These are the mini black holes which uh, Stephen Hawking and others have worked on. Uh, you, you, you can also note here that solids lie on a line roughly of slope 3. You start off with a, uh, an, an atom at the bottom, and you go up on a slope 3 there, um, and if you imagine uh, sugar lumps, um, people, and asteroids, etc., gravity is unimportant. But when you build up something as big as a planet, then gravity is strong enough to make it round. And if you get as big as Jupiter, gravity is strong enough to actually crush it, and then you get to the domain of the stars. So you can see here that when you get up to about 10 to the 57, uh, gravity has, has caught up. Incidentally, before leaving this, um, on the left-hand side, uh, there's uh, uh, an important number, the Planck scale. Uh, this is uh, a black hole uh, whose radius is the same as its as the, com as the quantum fuzziness in its position. These are the smallest black holes you could imagine. And this is the smallest scale on which space may have a complex structure. Well, I show this because we can ask what would happen if gravity had a different strength. So the large number was not 10 to the 40th. Well, this diagram would actually look more or less the same, although the scale would be more compressed. Um, stars, gravitationally bound fusion reactors, would be less massive and would burn faster if gravity was stronger. But you'd still, you'd still have planets, etc. but uh, you'd have uh, less time and less space, and objects as big as us would be crushed by gravity. So it is clear that gra gravity needs to be weak to allow an interesting universe with lots of time and space. But it's important that gravity is not fine-tuned. In fact, if gravity was, say, a factor 10 weaker, that might be even better because there's more time and you could have bigger structures uh, before gravity crushes them. So gravity must be weak, but it uh, isn't fine-tuned. The second requirement for a complex cosmos is what I call non-trivial chemistry, having a periodic table or something like that. And, of course, we uh, physicists are familiar with the, uh, the uh, binding energy as a function of mass for the different uh, nuclei, and uh, uh, these nuclei are stable. We've got the periodic table, and also we have uh, nuclear fusion available because uh, going all the way from hydrogen up to iron, you release uh, energy, which is what fuels the stars. And this requires a sort of tuning between two forces, the so-called strong nuclear force, which holds complex nuclei together, and the electric force, which disrupts them. Well, people have explored what would happen if this ratio was different. I'm going to just take an extreme case. Uh, let's suppose uh, that uh, uh, we have a counterfactual universe where th there's no chemistry, where hydrogen is the only element. Well, the universe would actually look much the same on a large scale. Galaxies would form. Stars would shine, but they'd release less gravitational energy, turning into white dwarfs or black holes. There could even be Jupiter-like planets of solid, solid hydrogen. But there'd be no chemistry, certainly no life as we know it, probably no complexity. So this, uh, as it were, the nuclear-free universe would resemble our actual universe only to the extent that, say, a marble statue resembles a real human being. In a large scale, it would look more or less the same, but otherwise not. So... Uh, we do need a non-trivial chemistry, which requires a certain amount of tuning. Now, we also, of course, uh, need to have uh, some atoms to make the stars. And uh, there again, uh, many people wonder about this, because if there's matter and antimatter symmetry, then we have, um, 
we, we would only have uh, um, just radiation now. And uh, as it is now, uh, we have um, the, this mixture of uh, dark energy, Einstein's lambda, um, and we have um, uh, atoms and dark matter. And there's quite a wide range of tolerance, but if the dark energy was too dominant, then gravity wouldn't pull galaxies together at all, and there must be enough atoms, of course, to uh, make the stars. So here again, uh, there's a parameter range, um, and although we don't need to have any particular fine-tuning. And we also uh, need to have um, the fluctuations, and the number 10 to the minus 5, uh, which is the amplitude of the fluctuations, which, uh, which we, we mentioned, um, that uh, determines the scale of structures in the universe. Um, but if we had a universe where um, that amplitude was smaller, then galaxies wouldn't pull themselves together. If the amplitude was too large, then you get huge structures like uh, black holes forming out too early. So this number Q, which measures the uh, metric fluctuation in the early universe, it's about 10 to the minus 5, and uh, it would have to be between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus uh, 6 in order to allow a universe with, with stars. So if we're in a multiverse then considerations like this tell us that we live not in a typical domain, but in a subset which allows complexity to develop, which has to be in the parameter range I've indicated in these counterfactual universes. I'd like to offer a flashback to planetary science 400 years ago, even before Newton. At that time, Kepler thought the Earth was unique and its orbit was related to the other planets by beautiful mathematical ratios. We now realize that this isn't right and that Earth's orbit is special only insofar as it's in a range of radii and eccentricities where life could exist. Some don't like the multiverse idea because it would render the hope for neat explanations of the fundamental physical numbers as vain as Kepler's new neurological quest to understand the solar system. So there are really these two options. Either all key constants are determined uniquely, or we're in a multiverse, and we observe just bylaws, secondary consequences of some deeper fundamental theory. Well, I think we have to be open-minded about these two possibilities. We could be in one big bang, or we could be part of a vastly larger and much more diverse ensemble. About 10 years ago, I was on a panel at Stanford where we were asked how much we'd bet on the multiverse. I said, on a scale, would you bet your goldfish or your dog or your life? I was nearly at the dog level. <laughs> Andre Linde was on the panel, and he's the man who spent 25 years inventing the, uh, the um, eternal inflation universe. He said he'd bet his life on it. And when told about this, the great theorist Steven Weinberg said he'd happily bet Martin Rees' dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> well, Andre Linde, my dog and I will all be dead before this is settled, but it's not metaphysics. It's highly speculative, but it's exciting science, and it may be true. If I want a logo for this entire research area, I'd choose this, an Ouroboros. The image depicts the interconnectedness of micro world on left and cosmos on the right. The inner space of atoms and the outer space of the universe. There are links between small and large, left and right. Our everyday world is determined by atoms and chemistry. Stars are powered by nuclear fusion. And higher up, there's another link. Galaxies are held together by subnuclear particles. We don't know what. The left is the domain of the quantum. On the right-hand side, Einstein's theory holds sway. And normally, there's no overlap between these two. Chemists don't need to worry about gravity between the atom and the molecule. Astronomers don't need to worry about quantum fuzziness in planetary orbits. But if we really want to understand the beginning of the universe, to understand what banged and why it banged, and whether there are indeed other big bangs, then we need a synthesis symbolized gastronomically at the top between the quantum world and the uh, world of Einstein. And this is, of course, a 21st century challenge. But before leaving this, I want to note that there's a third frontier, there's the very 
Small on the left, very large on the right, but it's very complicated at the bottom. Insects, people, and mountains. And this third frontier is the most challenging of all. This is a famous flea drawn by Newton's least favorite colleague, Robert Hooke, a pioneer inventor of the microscope. And I show this to indicate that even an insect, with its layer upon layer of complexity, is harder to understand than a star, where intense heat and compression by gravity preclude complex chemistry. So our complex everyday world presents intellectual challenges as daunting as those of the cosmos and the quantum. Biologists aren't held up by uncertainties in subnuclear physics, but because the structures they're studying are very complicated. Which I put in this digression to highlight the unity of science, and also, I suppose, as a deferential gesture towards the 99% of scientists who are neither particle physicists nor cosmologists and who work on this third frontier. But let me conclude by zooming in from the universe, or even from an ensemble of universes, to realities closer to here and now. I'm often asked, is there a special perspective that astronomers can offer to science and philosophy? Well, we view our home planet in a vast context, of course, but the important thing is that we can offer an awareness of an immense future. The tremendous time spans of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture, unless you live in Kentucky or parts of the Muslim world. But most people still somehow think that we humans are the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that hardly seems credible to an astronomer. Indeed, we're probably nearer the beginning than the end. Our sun formed 4.5 billion years ago, but it's got 6 billion years before the fuel runs out. It then flares up, engulfing the inner planets, and the expanding universe will even then continue, perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> so any creatures witnessing the sun's demise six billion years hence, they won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug. Post-human evolution here on Earth and far beyond could be as prolonged as the evolution has led to us and even more wonderful. Darwin realized this. But future evolution will actually happen faster than Darwinian selection. It will be on a technological timescale driven by advances in genetics and AI. But my final thought is this. Even in the context of a concertina timeline extending billions of years into the future and into the past, this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has our planet's future in its hands. When our creative intelligence could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution, even more marvelous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber, or environmental catastrophes that foreclose all such potentialities. So our Earth, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place. It may be a unique place. And we're its stewards at a specially crucial era, the Anthropocene era. And that's, I think, a key message to finish with for all of us, whether we're astronomers or not. Thank you very much.